Stanley, thanks so much for coming on to 27 Roosh. I appreciate the invitation, the opportunity to talk with you and your audience. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm not one for uh, small talk or introduction, so I'm going to drive uh, right into the meat and potatoes here. Many would argue, I think, that a republic is sick. There's a sickness infecting America at the moment, and part of that sickness manifests as wokery. I don't know that it's the principal or central issue, but it's certainly one of the symptoms uh, of the, the larger sickness in America right now. So my question to you is whether this sickness is self-induced or the result of some kind of foreign influence campaign. I, mean, I look at some of the more uh, colorful and, and ridiculous elements of wokery that we see today. And I wonder, is this some kind of relic of Soviet influence that sort of ran away and took legs of its own and, and sort of uh, had mutations that grew into bizarre things, it, like some of the weirder stuff we see around race and gender? Um, or is it something new entirely? Uh, I think, yeah, I'm not, I, I think, yeah, I think that that's, that's a good place to begin. <laughs> You've given me a lot of wiggle room and I do appreciate that. Um, well, the fact is, you know, something that's interesting that a lot of people may not realize is that uh, when leftists lose a battle as they lost in say 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1990, 91, with the fall of the Soviet Union, they immediately retreat into a, a kind of a melancholic state. And they actually have a term for this. It's called left melancholy. And I think if you look at scholar Wendy Brown, you look back at Walter Benjamin, uh, this idea that we on the left, I'm not on the left, of course, but we, generally speaking, on the left, um, feel very badly about our defeats. And, and, and this is because we uh, embrace our leftist principles wholeheartedly. We have a belief in, in, in humanity and we want the best for our human, the human condition. We want the best for um, uh, humanity in general. And whenever socialism or communism is defeated, uh, they go into this kind of melancholic uh, stupor and they write about their melancholy. And I have a number of volumes on this. It's an interesting phenomenon. And I think that what we find from this and the message that we should undertake, I should say, should uptake from this is that they don't give up. It, it, history doesn't matter to the folks who are propounding the type of the type of ideology that you have just expressed. You called it wokery, but it's really a it's really the same old Marxist wine in a, in a new bottle. Um, Marxism, neo Marxism, postmodernism, Michel Foucault's postmodernism. It's really all the same old wine. I mentioned Foucault for a very particular reason because he stands aside. I mean, he's a really brilliant scholar and said some very interesting things to say. A lot of people don't realize that he was a Maoist uh, in, from 1970 to 1974. and was heavily involved in the French communist movement, particularly the Maoists. He was uh, uh, not necessarily a buddy of Herbert Marcuse of the, the same time frame. But at that particular point in time, that juncture, 1968, say to 1972 or so, uh, there were what were called the three M's. It was Marcuse, Marx, and, and Mao. And you, any committed Marxist, this, these are the words of Marcuse, any committed Marxist was, you, know, you really weren't Marxist if you weren't Maoist, because Mao was the, the leading light, uh, uh, given, the, given the dregs of what happened to the Soviet Union, which was basically on the decline in that period of time. And Mao was giving them, uh, giving the left, left wing new hope. Um, and, and so this idea of left melancholy is that we're going to retreat into our shell until we can regather ourselves for the next push. And that's kind of a long-winded way of saying uh, for you, Scott, that the things we're seeing today in today's uh, American society is the latest push of this, uh, this wokery. It's really the, the latest push for of the philosopher, economist, historian Karl Marx from the 18. Uh, 50s on into the 1860s, uh, the philosophy that he began, and he was a great philosopher, a great, uh, not so great economist, uh, but certainly one of the, the uh, humanity's great minds, and we ignore him to our peril. Uh, his works have been refurbished and reworked and rehauled uh, over the long period. And so what we're seeing right now is simply the latest edition of Marxist ideology, 
It's neo-Marxist. It comes from critical theory, which gave birth to critical legal studies, which gave birth to critical race theory, uh, which has metastasized into uh, the into common parlance would be the uh, the anti-racism, which is simply another one of the banners that our friends on the left are are marching under. So yes, that's a long-winded way of saying that you are exactly right. It is another. It's an alien ideology, as it has always has been an alien ideology, alien to the United States, in the sense that we come out of our form of government, comes out of a different tradition. It comes out of the Anglo-Scottish Enlightenment of Edmund Burke, Adam Smith, Adam Ferguson, David Hume, whereas the French Revolution and Bolshevik Revolution in today's wokery comes out of the um, French Revolution, the, the works of, of Voltaire and Diderot, D'Alembert, Condorcet, uh, and, and, and those types of folks. It's a very different vision for how we should govern ourselves. And I, oh, I, forgive me, I left out Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, and, and so this is a very different way of imagining how we should govern ourselves and how we should work uh, <clears throat> and live and uh, commiserate with our, our fellow human beings. Um, but I, I want to, I have a couple follow-up questions here. First, I want to dig into the differences, as you understand them, between the Anglo-Scottish Enlightenment and the French Revolution. You mentioned Condorcet and Voltaire, among a few others, on the French Revolution side, and then obviously Hume uh, and, then, and Adam Smith uh, on the Anglo-Scottish side. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? I sure can. Uh, if we want to find two volumes that really embrace this notion of the difference, you look at Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France compared to his, his intellectual adversaries work, Rights of Man, Thomas Paine. Uh, and these two volumes really encompass the philosophical differences between the two revolutions and the philosophy of philosophical strains that animated them both. Uh, we find that the Enlightenment period, which, I mean, it's just, just a wonderful enlightenment. The American university, universities in general, are a product of the enlightenment, having expunged what we consider superstition, sorcery, magic thinking, uh, pseudoscience out of the university. Thomas Jefferson was a part of that. Benjamin Franklin, of course. Again, Adam Smith um, and that sort of thing. You look over at, on, the, at the, on the continent, you look at Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the idea that the perfection, the, uh, uh, the idea that human beings can be perfected, the idea that... Um, that, uh, and this is one of the keystones of the continental enlightenment uh, with uh, Voltaire and Diderot and et cetera, et cetera, that human beings can be perfected. We just need to come up with the right institutions. Uh, we need to sweep away the um, dregs of uh, tradition that have served no purpose. Uh, and this is exactly uh, what happened in the French Revolution beginning with the year one. You look at, uh, 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 I'm sorry. the, the Robespierre? Robespierre, yes. You look at Robespierre and his idea of, you know, Thermidor and, and we're going to begin in the year one and uh, we're going to uh, basically deal with our enemies on the, the, uh, on the guillotine. And, uh, and of course, the guillotine basically uh, took Robespierre in, in the end. And in fact, Edmund Burke, who opposed Thomas Paine, Thomas Paine was in Paris at the time and he was in a French prison. It was in terms, it took the intervention of uh, Edmund Burke, if I'm not mistaken, to basically help Thomas Paine out of the prison that, in which he found himself because of his embrace of this, this idea of the rights of man. Meanwhile, uh, England considered, continued with its notion of tradition, its notion of uh, the individual, individual rights, individual freedom, and um, certainly with the economic ideas of Adam Smith um, and the uh, philosophy of David Hume uh, crafted a very different vision. And I, that basically the United States, uh, uh, the founders of the United States embraced and incorporated in the, uh, the U.S. Well, Declaration of Independence, but of course, later on the Constitution of 1789. Those are the basic differences. Yeah. Did you, I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to, to square what you're saying with my understanding of the French Revolution, just for my own enrichment and edification, um, Rousseau wrote about a return to nature. So I, I mean, I, I understand the, the the line of argument you're making is, and give me some rope here, correct me if I'm wrong, is basically that the 
turn away from tradition from the French Revolution ultimately manifested in Foucault's post-structuralism and in sort of communist ideas like let's not let's throw away the past let's let's start over let's have as Robespierre called it year one but Fr France is also a country from which the declaration of rights of man and citizen came which is I mean there's in some cases verbatim text uh, or very similar text between uh, like Locke and former Locke uh, uh, writing from John Locke and the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. So I wonder if the roots of postmodernism, the, the 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 movement or the the sort of groping towards post-structuralism comes from the French Revolution. I mean, obviously, a lot of postmodernism did come out of France or French academics. Um, there were also French academics who pushed strongly against it, like Raymond Aron. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, uh, I, I wasn't aware of the, the three M's you mentioned <laughs> at the beginning, uh, Marcuse and Mao, and uh, who was the third M? Marx. Marx, yes, obviously. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I, per, I, I hadn't, uh, and and I don't uh, see the French Revolution as a precipitating force. But maybe I'll, I'll do some more reading on this. Well, a lot of people who, um, a lot of people think that the two revolutions were animated by the same principles. And I think that just, um, and I, I congratulate you on your inquiry because a lot of people don't have, don't have that kind of interest uh, these days. Um, but the, the French Revolution was animated, I think, by the same types of uh, philosophical notions that animated the Bolshevik Revolution. That's not an original notion with myself. Uh, that's uh, simply the idea that we're going to wipe away. Um, ba ba of course, uh, let me interject here that the uh, the Bolshevik Revolution had the uh, the additional either benefit or or, kings or the and SARS. We're going to wipe well, away yeah, kings. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And, and of course, they had the uh, added incentive of Marxian uh, the idea of scientific socialism. You know that Karl Kautsky followed uh, Marx as the appointed heir, and of course Vladimir Lenin. Uh, embracing this idea of scientific socialism, we're going to wipe away the. Uh, we're going to make the jump from a both from a, a proletariat. I'm sorry, from a uh, uh, aristoc aristocracy. We're going to jump the bulls the uh, the uh, bourgeois re revolution, and we're going to go straight to a proletarian revolution based on the peasantry, because we really don't have we being the Russians really don't have uh, an industrial class or a real uh, a, a, a bourgeois middle class. Uh, so we're going to go jump right into um, the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat slash peasantry. Um, Paul Hollander, let me let me perhaps introduce or interject something new into our discussion. Paul Hollander was a sociologist at uh, uh, UMass Amherst, and he has he's been writing on this type of left melancholy that I mentioned earlier and the idea of the uh, idea of political pilgrims, the idea of seeking something that is new, something that is different an alternative to the great injustices that the left sees in our capitalist, modern capitalist society. Uh, the injustices being, of course, how you measure you know, income, how you measure the, the, the lifestyles of, of the rich and you know, the rich versus middle class versus poor. And why can't we alleviate these types of uh, pathologies in a society? Why can't we move to something that is more just? Why can't we do that? And Paul Hollander, uh, in his book, Political Pilgrims, from, I believe, 1978. But he's also come up with, come out with several other books after that. One is Anti-Americanism. Um, and in this, he studies left-wingers, uh, very famous left-wingers. He's you know, Bertrand Russell, he's Anna Louise Strong, um, the, uh, and a host of others who made their pilgrimages to the Soviet Union in the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution. And the idea was that they went there with rose colored glasses, or I should say maybe red colored glasses, and refused to see the actuality of what they actually were seeing. And like Ronald Reagan said, don't be afraid to see what you see. Well, they were steadfastly refused to see the poverty, to see anything that was real. All they saw was promise, not poverty, but promise. Um, they refused people like Walter Durante steadfastly refused to acknowledge the man-made famine that Stalin inflicted on the Ukraine. Uh, I'm sorry, it was called the Ukraine at the time, but now it's Ukraine. 
um, and which killed a number of a million people and refused to report on that to the to the to the uh, to New York Times. This is part and parcel of the type of averted gaze that many left-wing mm. intellectuals from the West um, engaged in. And, and they, get, they move from country to country, seeking this socialist uh, panacea, the socialist utopia. And they move from the Soviet Union to China. They move from China after the, uh, after the um, uh, depravities of the various campaigns of you know, the Great Leap Forward in the 1950s, the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976, moved, uh, they, it, they soured on, on Mao. And so they moved to Fidel in, in, uh, in uh, Cuba. Cuba. Then they moved to, uh, to uh, uh, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua when Cuba didn't pan out. So you find this, this pilgrimage and in every place they go, they are feted. They are uh, lavished upon. They are lavished praise. They are they're given their wine and the uh, 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 it's a first class red carpet rollout for these intellectuals. And they come back with these glowing stories of, um, you know, of, of, of world of plenty, cornucopia. The system works. Socialism works. I have seen the future and it is in the Soviet Union. I've seen the future. And it is in Cuba. I've seen the future. They're forever seeing the future, and it really never pans out. And yet, this ideology of Marx, which it all goes back to, Marx, critic, neo-Marxism, even some of the postmodernism of, of Foucault, as I said, he spent time, four years or so, as a committed Maoist, um, it's always there, like a shining light in the distance. And we think we're getting closer, and finally we have this socialist utopia, only to be disappointed yet again, and we retreat to our left melancholy. I think there's a book by Traverso, uh, by Traverso called Left Melancholy, if you wanted to, if your audience wanted to check it out. It acts an entire book on this really narcissistic idea that, my gosh, we are, we are made to feel badly about the socialist failure, and yet maybe we should keep hope alive and, and, and give, gird ourselves, gather ourselves for the next great leap forward. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to lick your wounds and, and gather yourself for the next push. I, I mean, I am of the opinion, rightly or wrongly, I, I believe rightly, that the marketplace of ideas will eventually correct out for bad ideas, as it did with socialism in the 20th century. We saw the fall of the Berlin Wall first and then the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um I wanna, I wanna just, I wanna, I wanna like hone in on on one point though. You talk about a push, an active push that the left is that the left. I mean, what does that even mean? But we we can we can get into that. So first of all, let's define wh where this is coming from. Who is the left? Is this leftist academics? Is this leftist politicians? What what is the strand of leftism which you're describing manifest? That would be my first question. Uh, actually, well, before giving you another one, let's define that. Okay. Um, well, well, I, I think that the home of the left has always been in the university because the university mm -hmm. is is welcoming to those kinds mm -hmm. of ideas. Let me point out something you said that I happen to agree with. When you said marketplace of ideas, I'm, I'm, I refer to not the general market out here, but, you know, the general marketplace is usually unkind to ideas, but I'm referring to the marketplace of ideas on the American campus, American mm -hmm. university, the traditional enlightenment university. The idea that it's Max Weber's idea that the university should be a crucible of the best that has been thought and said, a repository, yeah. a repository of, of knowledge uh, that we in the, you know, the academy are trying to do our best to add to. At the same time, we transmit this what has been thought and said to the next generation, which can take it or leave it as they see fit. And this marketplace of ideas is a vigorous marketplace in the sense that ideas are not welcome without criticism. If you enter this new, these ideas into the marketplace, you had best be ready to defend those ideas against rigorous criticism. Yes. Um, and that's the, mm. that's the nature of, of the university. Now there's another vision or another conceptualization of the university, which is the uh, university should be a crucible training young people for the struggles of the future, of the Marxist future. And this crucible should admit certain ideas as be, as adding to what they call they being the le radical left wingers as critical consciousness. You mean uh, these are academics? Yes. 
Yes, yes, yes. of course. Um, and not, not all academics, of course. In fact, a lot of the liberals, good liberals, I know many of them on the campus who simply want to teach. They want to do their research. Uh, they want to do their service. And uh, they're not in the business of the anti-Viberian Viberian view of the university as um, this is my bully pulpit. And no matter what the course topic is, I'm going to talk about my personal politics mm. and I'm going to convey because the the moment is here and the necessity is here. When I was a, a young graduate student at Duke University, Frederick Jameson, a committed Marxist theorist, was uh, on the faculty. And he said in a talk while I was there, he said that uh, the purpose of the university is to train cadres for the struggles of the future. And he wasn't talking about imbuing subsequent generations with the ideas of Adam Smith. That's not what he was talking about. He was talking about Marx, basically, because this was the place. This was the this was the place that the academy um, had in society, training young people for those struggles of the future, probably probably uh, addressing that left melancholy and bringing people out of their shells and girding them up and re, you know, rearming them for the, the next push forward. But your question is, who is igniting this push or who is generating this push? It's always been the ac academics, and I'm referring to uh, the far left academics, not, not your good liberal who wants to accept the university as we have it, as an arena where, uh, where you, Scott, and I can, can sit down and talk about these ideas and we can agree to disagree, and it, it, may, get, you know, it may get testy or something. But there are a group of people who don't want that arena. They want new ideas introduced. They're really not new ideas, I should say. They want new ideas introduced into the university, this marketplace, without criticism. Mm -hmm. It's you can't criticize these ideas because they are they are received. They constitute received truth. And this is what is different about today. Today's push. The idea that we have two types of people. Where there are people who are imbued with false consciousness and there are people who are imbued with critical consciousness. Then, then these are it's a tautology. It's really basically who are who are those with critical consciousness? Well, these are those who've been brought to the light. It's really the most modern latest version of Plato's cave, where you come out of Plato's cave and you see that you've been living a lie. The folks that are in the cave are, you know, see only the shadows on their wall. I'm going to go back into the cave and they're going to try to kill me because I want to bring them out into the, into the light. This is very similar to, I'll say very similar to the idea of false consciousness and critical consciousness. These are the critical consciousness is kind of a reworking of Marx's old class consciousness. It's designed to incorporate race and gender to go along with class. Um, and when you acquire the critical consciousness, you emerge from the cave, this means that you can peer into the society and see the contradictions that you can, uh, you can embrace and, and, and recognize the relationships of power and privilege. Um, and, your and your task is to then bring others into the light of critical consciousness. That's the dynamic that we find on today's college campuses. And I talk about these, if I can hold up my book, I'll do that right here. That's what I talk about in my latest book, Brutal Minds, the uh, dark world of left-wing brainwashing in our, our universities. That is what is afoot in our universities today. I think there's a number of things afoot and you talk about many of them, um, but th that's certainly one. I just, you know, I found it to be curious that many of, I went to Princeton as an undergraduate. I found it to be curious that many of the under of my undergraduate peers who professed uh, commitments to various social justice causes, first in their applications to Princeton and then once they were at Princeton, somehow abandoned those commitments as they marched off to work in investment banks, management consultancies, mm -hmm tech companies, uh, and then, you know, a few, uh, a few ones went to, to law or medicine. Those are really the five main fields uh, that people marched off into. There was obviously outliers and exceptions. Um, so first of all, I have a question. I mean, if as this professor who you mentioned at Duke, when you were at Duke in the 90s, um, you, you started in 92, I believe, correct? I uh, finished and I got out of there in 92. I, I was 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. It's the good, it's the good skincare routine, I guess. Oh, I, okay, I, made, well, I, made, I made you a couple years that. younger. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we can um, continue that progress if you want to. That's, <laughs> um, I was there in the 2000s. <laughs> um, 
No, so, I mean, this professor said, we're here, we're training the Marxists of the future. My peers who were social justice advocates did not go off and become Marxists right. of the future. Someone who's working at Goldman Sachs is not, no matter what they tell themselves, working to change the system from the inside. They're working at Goldman Sachs. Or they're working at McKinsey or Bain or BCG or Google or whatever other, you know, similar kind of institution, uh, company. Um so first off, I have a question. How do we, how do we square? I know that um, that these these industries, management consulting, investment banking, recruit from a very small uh, number of elite universities. I know this is not all American college campuses that kids are going off to become investment bankers. So it's it's not at all representative. But it is in the case of me. It's, I mean, it's my experience because I went there. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you for your opinion on, on how you would reconcile this. The kids who profess commitments to social justice and then don't act, though they do not go off and work in social justice causes. Um, they're not being, even if professors are attempting to train them as Marxists of the future, they're failing because those students are going off to work in finance and consulting, right? Or maybe I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Well, sure. My uh, view that, um, I, and I propound this view uh, in my book as a result of the research that I conducted, that there is a great deal of brainwashing that goes on on the campuses. I'll, I'll move away from that trigger word to utilize the more the formal word for it is thought reform or thought rectification or thought re remolding. Uh, the idea, not everyone's susceptible to it. Uh, the idea. No, but we, of, we we talk about all the campuses in a second. I'm talking specifically about like your campus, Harvard. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, Williams. Okay, well, let me get to that. Well, let me get to that in a moment. I'll tell you that not everyone is susceptible to, to the message that's being propounded. Um, and a lot of people who are, uh, the message is targeted toward the entire group, but certain folks are going to be more receptive to that message. And you'll find those people. You'll find lots of them at Princeton, I'm sure. You'll find, in fact, a lot of them uh, signed that, uh, the uh, manifesto, I think, that was uh, I think 300 staffers, uh, they were faculty, staff, et cetera, et cetera, who signed a, a manifesto to the president saying that there was racism running rampant at Princeton, whenever right. no, no single example was ever produced uh, to show. This, is, I think, was, a, uh, I can't think of the writer's name for the Atlantic, um, not, not Bezeitenoid, is that, I can't, Friedersdorf. He wrote an article for the, for the Atlantic in which he said, hey, I, I contacted as many of these people as I could, about 290 of them, to ask them, can you give me a specific example of the type of uh, a type of horrendous racism at Princeton that occurred over the last 10 years? And he got not one example from that crew of people who signed this, this letter. And so that's an example of the type of, of thing, the type of ethos that I see at Princeton, uh, your, your campus. Your question has to do with why do people go into corporate America uh, to take the take the money? I would say that is across the board. You'll find students who are uh, students of color, stu uh, uh, non-white students, will, will go, white students will go into this because they are seeing something that perhaps the social justice warriors don't see. And that is creating value for your fellow human beings. That's what I teach. I teach in a business school and I teach wealth creation. And everyone in the business school teaches that regardless of their topic or the sub whether it's finance or accounting or operations management or supply chain management, retail, et cetera, et cetera. It's creating wealth for the betterment of your human, of your, of your fellow man and woman. And, and the point is, if you don't create something that's valuable for your fellow human beings, you will go out of business. And that's for the young people who do, want, who do decide to go into business. I will tell you that a lot of the, the jobs that you're talking about, a lot of my students want to have. We have a wonderful co-op program where students go into these summer jobs and out of summer jobs. Not They're not the jobs that I had when I was an, an undergraduate. I worked in a on an assembly line. I worked as a garbage collector. I worked for the telephone company and I worked in tobacco fields. Um, I worked uh, for in tobacco fields for a dollar an hour for uh, five years through high school, all through high school. I worked as a bag boy at the grocery counter. That's not the kind of summer job these young people want, BlackRock and J.P. Morgan and, and, and that sort of thing. So I learned a great deal. I like to think 
that I learned a great deal about humility and about forbearance and about respecting one's fellow human beings, regardless of their station uh, in life. I do not fault anyone for doing pursuing the path that you have just laid out. Um, I, I don't think of that as a pejorative. Certainly not everyone that you knew did that. That would be a very successful class. I'm sure that a lot of people who were in the, uh, I don't know, what I think you were, you were a history major or something like that, right? I was, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that you knew a lot of people who did pursue that uh, social justice. God, went to work for a nonprofit, maybe went into the Peace Corps, um, uh, went into a number of, of venues in the nonprofit world. Um, there's a, lo a lot of well-heeled nonprofit people that do this sort of thing. But college does not mean, just becoming part of the social justice cause, I'm not a big fan of that term, social justice, does not mean that you have to live and breathe uh, social justice. It means you, have, you do have to earn a living. And that means um, creating wealth for your fellow, fellow human beings. And that's how we exist. It doesn't, that's not how it worked in the old Soviet Union. It's not how it worked in, works in China. It's certainly not how it works in North Korea, a wealth-destroying society where you live in a command economy. Um, and the collective is far more important than the individual. Um, so I hope that I kind of talked around that. I'm more than happy to continue talking if you'd like me to. I would. I would like you to. I want to. I want to harp on a couple points here. One, I, I don't know that I see investment banking necessarily as a pejorative. I simply found it to be surprising that the same mm -hmm. students who professed their commitments to social justice mm -hmm. yeah. causes, or we can use this right. to left leftist causes, if you want to say this, then went into a field right. which did very little for those causes. You're saying you work in a, you know, you create wealth, which is, is good for the, the betterment of your fellow man and is, is necessary mm -hmm. for human flourishing. So the, the argument could be made that this is, and they are, in fact, becoming productive members of, of society. In the case of investment banking and management consulting, these are prestigious, decorated, and well-paying jobs in a lot of cases, highly sought after. But I don't necessarily think that that makes them good or conducive to human flourishing. You talked about working in tobacco fields, working, you know, picking up garbage. Yep. Like yes. th th there's, there's, a, there's a thing... There are some companies that actually make products and there are yes. some companies that make shareholder dividends, you know, um, and I'm, it's not that all companies which produ mm -hmm. only produce shareholder dividends, right. you know, on a screen are bad. I, I don't mm -hmm. think that at all. I have a, well, many of my friends work in finance. I think in specifically the case of management consulting and investment banking, of all of the industries that exist, these are probably among the lowest on contributing to creating wealth for fellow human beings and, and, and human flourishing for yourself and other people. But correct me if I'm wrong, you work in a business school. I mean, what, like I, I, I clearly am an opinionated 20 something year old. So feel free to, to push back here. Well, just on the management consulting, people have a, I, I don't know what people think of when they think of consulting. Um, a, a lot of people who engage consultants have a real antipathy towards them. Uh, and want to know why these outsiders are coming in and doing well. Management consultants help people help. I should say help companies recognize inefficiencies. Uh, what are you? What are we doing wrong? And the one of the secrets of management consulting, why we have them, is because outsiders can say things that insiders cannot. I mean, uh, low rungs on the totem pole at a, at a company. You know, you can see what's wrong, but no one's going to listen to you or talk to you. Uh, a, a consultant, someone who's highly paid. Bain or McKinsey, like uh, Pete Buttigieg was, uh, they're going to come in, going to come in and point out what anyone in the company probably could tell you otherwise. And the fact is, they're going to make the company perhaps, perhaps leaner, meaner, and and utilize less resources to make the same products, or they're going to utilize the same resources to create more value. That's the function of a management consultant. Uh, a lot of times, it's a fig leaf for what the uh, CEO wants to do, or he wants to say, look, I called in a management consultant. Uh, what else could I do? And this person identifies some prob the problems we had, the team identified problems we had, and we've tried to correct them, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that really 
piqued my interest with respect to your classmates. You said these people are, have professed their commitments to social justice. I hear that too. I hear that now. A lot of your undergraduates say these types of things in a reflexive manner because the discourse that we have around the campus that is originated. Popular. Well, yes, it originates on what I call the soft side of campus where the humanities and social sciences are, are, are located, save for economics, which is located in our building. And uh, we find a lot of magic thinking and sorcery and pseudoscience and a lot of feelings based, based professions, uh, wishful thinking, fables, fiction, fantasy, uh, a lot of that, along with some real good social science that's conducted. Um, we find qualitative research, which uh, is, is basically the idea we're going to do journalism and go to call it social science. And so what has happened is a lot of students, you know, they want to get through the, the course. OK, I don't talk about social justice in my classes. It simply doesn't apply. Um, and socialism, which is I think is a kind of like the end result of what social justice is supposed to be uh, supposed to be uh, striving for uh, is, is a wealth redistribution system. No, it's not a wealth creation. I'm engaged in teaching people how to create wealth. Well, this discourse mm -hmm. from the soft side of campus begins to make its way over here. And the reflexive mouthing, uh, it's very performative. I'm sure you're familiar with that yep. term, very performative, where I'm going to come in here, I've got to stand up, I've got to perform, I've got to, you know, to, to embrace the cliches, the mantras. Yeah. I want to survive on this campus. I'm, I'm going to go work in investment banking, but I also want to show that I have a conscience. I have, I, I'm, I have a, I'm not going to engage in moral hysteria uh, that I find on the soft side of campus, but I do want to, you know, I, I, pretty soon students be start, on the right side of things, you know, I want to be on the right side of history. Yeah. Such <laughs> BS. I, you know, it's like as history has a side, you know, it's one of those, uh, that's one of those, that's a very quasi Marxist kind of thing. The idea of Hegelian notion of the world spirit moving us along uh, and Marx's edition of the, the thesis and antithesis, creating a new thesis, et cetera, et cetera, synthesis rather, creating a new thesis. <laughs> Um, this kind of seeps in to the discourse that I hear a lot of on the campus. Be surprised how many people sur survive that without embracing that type of discourse. This may be not hypocrisy, but it may be uh, the an explanation, reasonable explanation of of what you've seen of with your your classmates. Um, getting these cushy jobs uh, with the various investment banking firms and management consulting firms. Um, uh, investment bankers, I think, or investment, uh, is that what you were saying? Investment bankers? Uh, yes. You're, yeah. That uh, you know, their work tends to make markets more efficient, tends to arbitrage. They can make money by arbitraging out different, you know, squeezing the various aspects of doing financial manipulations, keeping the market honest, keeping the... Um, I, uh, basically providing information, lots of information. Uh, they do a lot of research. Then what they do is not idle. They don't sit there waiting for the money to roll in. Um, they actually do have, have to be very smart uh, in what they do. There's no guarantee. Let me give you a hint, uh, not a hint, but it's just an interjection. Uh, one of my engineering students, um, a couple of, a couple of, about a year or two ago, came into my class and he wanted to know about how to, how to be, how to, he wanted guarantees of business strategy. He's an engineering student. X you know, plus Y is equals to Z. Yeah. He's used to that kind of formula. He says, well, you got Steve Jobs over here. You've got Elizabeth Holmes over here. Steve pursued this strategy and, and really scored big with Apple. And then Elizabeth Holmes pursued this strategy over here and is now in jail uh, for a uh, uh, Bilking $900 million uh, out of uh, Silicon Valley investors, was convicted of fraud, and is now serving an 11 year sentence in a minimum security prison, I believe, somewhere in Texas. How do you know which strategy is going to work? How do you know? And I said, well, you don't. So it's the same way you ask a stockbroker. How do I know which stocks are going to go up and which are going to come down? As if there's some sort of formula that will tell you this. And you're in school and college, and this, the, the revelation will be made to you. But of course, there is no formula for a successful strategy. There's only the ability to reduce uncertainty in what we do. And I think investment bankers do, do that sort of calculation. If they're good investment, if they're good strategists, you reduce uncertainty so that the bets that you make are more likely than not to be uh, to result in a solitary, at least to give a solitary result. I think in the, first of all, thank you. It's helpful and, and interesting purposes of this discussion, I think the, the one the one thing that comes to mind here on, on the subject of Elizabeth Holmes is just that 
from a from a game theory perspective, from an, like an evolutionary uh, perspective on cooperation and conflict, cheating can be not all, not it, it's not definite, but cheating can be a highly effective strategy in the short term. The problem with cheating is that it it never pans out in the long term. Eventually, you get caught, and then if you know you're with your evolutionary ancestors running around hunting and you're not, you haven't shared your meat with everyone else beforehand, you're going to starve to death or your investors aren't going to give you any more money. Or in Elizabeth's case, she goes to jail. Um, so if there's any, you know, you don't know if the stock is going up or down, you don't know what the right strategy is. But if we were to counsel anyone, I would say as a general principle, don't cheat. It's not like, yeah. uh, you mm -hmm. know, it, 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 sure. It can be effective in the short term, but I think it was Jamie Dimon, um, in one of his interviews, uh, he said, beware of get rich quick schemes. He said, maybe mm -hmm. they exist, but I've never seen one. Like I've never, I've never seen someone get rich overnight. Um, we, sometimes we like, we see the results of that or we see pictures on Instagram. Yeah. Even in those cases, mm -hmm. either they're fake or a lot of work went in ahead of time. And then right. you only saw the tipping point, but in order to, you know, push the, push the boulder up the mountain, there was, there was a lot of work arduous work that went in. So I, I, I just remember that Jamie Diamond quote with the interview. He said, yep. he said, have you ever seen someone get rich overnight? He says, no, I've never seen that. Maybe it's happened, but I not, not right. in my decades of experience. If I've yeah, seen you this. show up when the crops are coming up, you don't see the tilling of the soil and the fertilizer and the, the, the weeding and everything else. You know, it's one of those things where you come up with a good idea. You've got to do a lot of spade work before the money starts coming in. I, I like to hold this up in my classes. Uh, as an example of, of technology and technology innovation, you know what this hmm. is, right? Yeah, the coffee thing. Yeah, it's a coffee thing. It's called a Java jacket. A lot of people yeah. don't realize that. The guy who came up with this in the 90s, you know, we had to do this kind of thing when I was back in the day, back when I was, uh, you know, at uh, in school, you know, yeah, we had yeah. to put, the, oh, ow, 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 yeah. you put, the, put this around here. And then someone yeah. came up, hey, you know what? Why don't I make a corrugated cardboard jacket that I can put around the, uh, the coffee cup made millions off of that thing. But then again, Starbucks, believe it or not, cheated. And they said they, they, they looked at his invention, refused to buy it, and then made a different version of it, tweaked yeah. the patent a little bit. And he did not go after them in court because he said, you know, there's enough money for everyone. He was living very well himself. Um, but uh, th th this is an example of the kind of thing. This is not overnight. Now, this was something that he worked at by you know, distributing this at coffee trade shows they have coffee trade shows you know yeah and getting people to know the product to say hey this is a good idea getting investors and uh, then boom we suddenly see oh the java jacket the guy's a millionaire instant success well success is really never never instant it's the the, the product of long i think it was thomas edison who said you know most people miss opportunity because when it knocks it comes dressed in overalls and looks a lot like work yeah no. <laughs> so. that's funny yeah, I like that. Um, I go, I think back to um, I, I I think back to the title of your book. You know, the the mm -hmm. dark world of of left wing brainwashing. Um, and I just I wonder. We've talked about certain students doing this in a rather yeah. performative manner. Those are not really the well. I mean, maybe we should be worried about them. It's it's dangerous, of course, when everyone's going mm -hmm. along talking about how nice. The king's clothes are when, in fact, you know the king himself is is butt naked. Um, that's not good when everyone is is going along with a kind of play pretend uh, attitude. Certainly, that was the case in the Soviet Union. Um, but there is also a lot of students who aren't just like going along with it so they can get laid or so they can appear fashionable or whatever you know other version of that. There's some students who really are won over to rather dark ideas which are antithetical to human flourishing and which history has proven to be antithetical to human flourishing. So my, my question is about those students. First of all, I, beyond, beyond you know, quantitative and statistical research, have you seen examples of these students uh, on Drexel's campus? Not just, not just as undergraduates, but after they graduate. What are they doing after they graduate that is so dangerous or nefarious and so extreme that the marketplace of uh, that the marketplace of ideas will not correct out for like a lot of very smart people have argued that and i am partial to this idea that 
peak woke has already been reached, that we're kind of in remission on some of these bad ideas. The marketplace assessed them. They had their they had their time in the spotlight for a while or 10, 10 minutes of fame or whatever you want to call it. Um, and now people are like, I don't know any really smart, serious people who take some of the more extreme anti-racism stuff seriously. Then again, maybe it's the circles I run in and we did, uh, that manifesto was signed by a lot of Princeton faculty, not Princeton students, but Princeton faculty. It ultimately led, I mean, a lot of, there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes here, but uh, it ultimately led to the firing of Josh Katz, uh, Princeton classics professor. Um, he penned his article, A Declaration of, of Independence by a Princeton Professor in Quillette, uh, the uh, magazine I used to run. Very fine um, magazine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I uh, I was one of four people to, to run that magazine for a year. Uh, it's very unfortunate what happened to Professor Katz. Um, but he anyway, he wrote that piece in, in response mm-hmm. to the, the aforementioned yeah. manifesto, which, uh, which we discussed earlier in this conversation. Um, but I mean... Maybe I'm not as as uh, cynical or uh, negative, or you know, I, I, I didn't live through some of this stuff, of course. But is this really a problem? I mean, do you see? You, you talk about like the dark world of left wing brainwashing. Are these ideas so bad that they can't just be corrected out for in the market? They already were. We already clubbed them pretty hard with history, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, and the collapse of you know all of its sister republics all of all of the sort of socialism and 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 not all of it but a lot of socialism in latin america proved to not work i mean a hundred years ago argentina was one of the wealthiest countries in the world we're just there absolutely beautiful um, wonderful country um and now it's in a very precarious economic state same is true as venezuela same is true of many other countries in the region um I, i i guess my my question to you stanley is like are these bad ideas so nefarious that we cannot rely on the market to correct for them? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that the market place of ideas is one of the targets of the ideas yes. we're talking about. You stifle that's, debate. We're not going to yes. come. We're not. We won't. You know, deplatforming. Yes, and that's a good. That's a now, valid point. Now, uh, now. Changing that marketplace is a key goal of the folks I'm ta- we're talking about here. Now, first of all, when I say brainwashing or thought reform, who's doing it? Certainly, there are some professors involved in it. I can name Johnny E. Williams at Trinity. Uh, uh, it's uh, George Yancey at uh, Emory, Lisa Spannerman at University of Arizona, Ricky Lee Allen at New Mexico, uh, Zeus Leonardo at Berkeley, uh, and on and on. Daryl Wing. What about Drexel? Teaches- I'm not going to be talking about Drexel uh, here today. I prefer to uh, to do my, uh, uh, I would say, uh, discussions uh, behind closed doors here at Drexel and work as okay. a respected faculty member without putting anyone on the spot, without an ability to defend themselves in any way, shape, or form. Right. Okay. So, so um, uh, yeah, I've had those kinds of discussions here at, at Drexel. Um, I'm not someone who shies away from the DEI privilege walk or the DEI power and privilege seminar. In fact, I seek them out to find out what's going on. Now, uh, going back to your original question is, is this, are these ideas so nefarious that we have to worry about? Number one, the idea we're going to transform the university. When I say we, of course, I'm talking about them. We're going to transform the university into a different institution than what exists now that allows us to have these kinds of conversations. This is a key goal of these folks on the left. In fact, one of the nonprofits that are closely associated with universities around the country is called the ACPA. Uh, Its goal, its motto, let me reach around here and give you a, let me me reach around my desk here, there it is, and show you what their goal is. They sent me a thing, I'm a member of this organization. Where is that thing? Where is it? There it is, there it is. It says right here, can you read that? I am boldly transforming the uh, higher education. I am. I saved it. 
yes, yeah, student affairs faculty. Okay, they sent me that because I joined their group. They also sent me a mug over here of boldly transforming the university. Well, who are the people boldly transforming universities? Not faculty, except for the per the people who are in student affairs faculty teaching other people how to become bureaucrats in the university. This is where our bureaucracy comes from. Education schools teaching student affairs, master's degrees, and, and EDDs to train people for one job, one job only, and that is to go into higher education, where they can then become functionaries in what is called a co-curriculum that is going to, uh, it's a range of workshops called racial caucuses and brave spaces and um, di difficult dialogues and courageous conversations, basically the brainwashing um, where the brainwashing takes place. When I say brainwashing, I mean that literally. I mean Psychological, manip yeah, psychological manipulation, behavior modification designed to change a person's belief system. It's well grounded in, you can find it in DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, Edition 5. You can uh, find that the Chinese communists use it. The North Koreans have used it. The only other entity in the United States that use it are cults when they're recruiting people into their various, whatever their doctrine is. We use it, meaning we, meaning education schools, but also student affairs use it in a very, I would say, a very clandestine, deceptive way uh, designed to propagate these particular ideas. That's This is the methods. The methods are quasi-legal. It, it tries to put the student on a conveyor belt along, uh, along the path toward achieve, achieving this critical consciousness to destabilize a person's belief system, to change that belief system, and then to replace that belief system with one of, in, in, you know, grounded in critical consciousness. So what's the content? The content comes from uh, Paulo Freire. Now, Paulo Freire is a very interesting guy. He was a, his, his famous book, most famous book, Pedagogy of the Press, was published in 1970. It's the third most cited volume in the social sciences. Um, had you ever heard of Paulo Freire? No, I haven't. No, well, that's, that's what he is revered. He is the equivalent of Marx in education school uh, theory. Uh, theory. He is one of those things where we can't say if we're in education school, we cannot say that our doctrine in edu education schools is based on Karl Marx. We cannot say that, even though the, the primary theorists in this in this vein of, of scholarship are Marxists, self-avowed, not ashamed of it, not hiding it. But, you know, I'm talking about Henry Giroux, I'm talking about Ira Shore, Michael Apple, Bell Hooks, the famous novelist, um, Paulo Freire, Zeus Leonardo. Admitted, acknowledge Marxist, but they can't say, you know, I'm a Marxist and we're offering Marxist uh, education theory for American teachers. Can't say that. So they found, like Al Capone found a, a guy to launder his dirty money. He found a guy who could launder Marxist theory and they found Paulo Freire, Brazilian. He's got a gray beard, kindly visage, like a kindly uncle, became a Marxist uh, when he was visiting from uh, Brazil. He was visiting Peru, Paraguay. And he became a Maoist. He was a very great admirer of Mao Zedong, uh, his cult, the Cultural Revolution. He said that the Cultural Revolution is the most genial solution to the problem of converting the masses uh, of this century. Now, you know, the Cultural Revolution resulted in the deaths of at least two million people, uh, resulted in the upheaval and the, 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 the torture of hundreds of thousands uh, and set China back um, uh, certainly more than a decade that Cultural Revolution lasted. He was a great admirer, great admirer of Maoist education theory. This is the guy that education theorists in this country uh, offer as the model for an American education system. And it's this guy's ideas, um, along with a lot of his epigoni, his less talented followers coming along uh, behind him today. Um, and they all appear in brutal minds and carefully documented. Uh, the people who I'm talking about, uh, Cheryl Matias and Zeus Leonardo and um, uh, Johnny E. Williams. Um, and uh, they have this goal of transforming the university, number one, transforming individual students by way of this uh, brainwash. Uh, Beverly Daniel Tatum, Janet Helms. These are all people who have propounded the stage by stage progression to move students to a state of critical consciousness. No, it doesn't impact uh, all students, but it does lay a trap for those who are uh, what, what are called sheep. They're sheep and goats. So Richard Delgado is the one who identified this. Oddly enough, he's Mr. Critical Race Theory. 
he did a lot of studies on cults when he was a lawyer many years ago, and he found that sheep are the, were identified by the Unification Church or the Moonies as those who are middle class, open minded, looking around when they come to a a, a, a a seminar in the countryside. Goats were streetwise folks who were kind of looking out of the corner of their eyes, like like who look real skeptical. What's going on here? What's this all about? They were separated out. And the sheep were put into the weekend long program. The goats were given a perfunctory program and put on a bus sent back to town. And in this way, you separated out the naysayers from folks who are most susceptible to the message. And it's a very intoxicating message. It is absolutely it intoxicates graduate students. Why is it intoxicating? Because it. What is the message? The message is that you now have access to hidden knowledge in this idea of becoming critically conscious. You can peer into the contradictions within our society. You can peer in and see the power and the privilege. It enables you to see what others cannot see. And the message, of course, is that class-based, uh, race-based, gender-based uh, view of society that is offered by Paulo Freire and his less talented followers that came behind. Um, meanwhile, all those other folks on the campus, you know, probably Professor Ridgely, imbued with false consciousness. Certainly your parents have false consciousness. Uh, you've been granted access and they have a, they even have a have a, a vernacular. It's part of the critical theory vernacular. Critical theory, by the way, is is I'm sure you've heard of it. It's neo-Marxist. It comes out of the Frankfurt School. It's a fraud in the sense that the whole name critical theory was a contrivance to avoid saying Marx. I have a book by the, uh, the letters of, of Gershon, uh, Gersh, gosh, uh, Gershon Krom to uh, Walter Benjamin. And in these letters from, from uh, Gershon Krom to Walter Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, who was a member of the Frankfurt School, cautions him not to use the term Marxist for political reasons, because it's very untenable. Please use the terminology that we have created, that, cre that being critical theory, critical consciousness. Use the, use the vernacular. Talk about interrogating, interrogating uh, transgressing boundaries, interrogating uh, uh, institutions of power and privilege, uh, that kind of thing. And so the use of this kind of priesthood, this priestly vernacular, is part of this whole attraction. It's very intoxicating, uh, and you can recognize them by the folk. By the, we're going to unpack this now. We're going to unpack this and find out what the contradictions are. I, you know what I say? You know what? Why don't you put the Frere aside and go look at Mao Zedong's On Contradiction, his famous essay on contradictions, and you'll find it from the master, as opposed to reading it through, you know, from from Marx to Mao to Frere to American education schools. Why don't you go ahead and, and do that? That's the message and that's the danger and that's what is going on on the college campuses today. The argument could be made, just I, I'm harp, like circling back to sure. the definition you provided of brainwashing. The argument could be made that every time we read a book, we're being brainwashed because it changes the way that we think or um, maybe it doesn't um but every time i read a book in some way however unconscious or conscious it changes the way i think and then on a larger scale all the other media i consume the music i listen to the podcast i listen to uh social media clips and videos that, that i consume a lot tiktok for example or instagram you know these are other methods of, of disseminating information and they have been put to use by both the left and the right. These become highly, uh, I wouldn't say highly politicized, but they become tools used by those seeking to spread their ideas to other people. The, I, my podcast is consumed on social media by uh, in an audio format and video format mm -hmm. by lots of people. Every time we read a book, watch a video, listen to a song, we are on some level being influenced by that, I don't know that, does that mean that I'm being brainwashed by the music and the books I'm reading? I mean, perhaps, but I'm all, I'm, I guess I'm okay with that. I think where the line becomes, blur and, but I mean, again, this is, see here, it's interesting because it's nefarious, right? Like you don't know 
when you're scrolling through TikTok mindlessly for hours. I mean, I, I was talking to a girl this summer. She told me she spent five hours per day on TikTok. That, that, that's a lot of hours, right? Um, I, I, that, that's on the higher end of the spectrum. But people, you know, when you're scrolling through TikTok, you're not thinking to myself, ah, yes, the indoctrination begins. But the algorithm, if it feeds, it's totally self-perpetuating. It will feed you the things that you like and other, will suggest new content. The Explore page is suggesting new stuff. And there's no like genie with the control levers. It's a super, you know, computer super algorithm doing this. But you have TikTok on the one hand, you have music, you have the books. You're re young people, unfortunately, don't read enough books these days. But just say, you know, the books you're reading, all of the media that you're consuming affects the way you think in a kind of subconscious way. Like when I sit down to read in the evening, I don't think to myself, okay, I'm ready to change my mind. Like I, I sit down to read sometimes for entertainment, sometimes for learning. There's a lot of reasons a person could read. Um, but I want to dig into like this, where does the brainwashing begin? And the simply saying, oh, now I have more information. I read this, this beautiful prose by someone who maybe I don't, I didn't fully agree with before, but they've they've convinced me. And that's wonderful too. You can take, you know, an avowed Marxist and show them the the flaws in their thinking, or you can take somebody who's very conservative and walk them down a little bit and have them reconsider some of their positions. Um I don't I mean those aren't like bad things, but it does make me uncomfortable a little bit to know that via TikTok, via Instagram, via Spotify, Facebook, all these things where we are constantly consuming information just with the, with the flick of a thumb you know you go for hours here watching just tons of videos tons of content from tons of different people or in some cases the same person um like look at andrew tate if you're familiar with andrew tate and a little he, bit yeah I, he you know it, i was watching a lot of his videos at one point didn't agree with everything he said but i thought this isn't so bad and then i realized like the extent to which the algorithm had, I, I wasn't doing that much scrolling, to be honest. I, I have a full time job. <laughs> I don't have that much time to scroll. Um, but it's very good. It just starts like suggesting things, suggesting things. And so I guess my question to you, if there is a question in this uh, little diatribe that I've offered and I'm continuing to offer, is if all of the media we're consuming is subconsciously influencing us, where do we breach the threshold of brainwashing? And where is it just, oh, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a person who's consuming this and maybe it'll affect me, maybe it won't. I hope that I have the good judgment to know what's affecting me and what's not. Well, it's easy to, to draw that line that there's a big difference between simply consuming information or disseminating information and doing so with the intent to utilize uh, to, to uh, thought reform someone or to engage in thought remolding of someone. The most severe aspects of thought remolding uh, and, and, and brainwashing, uh, we find examples in China and in North Korea. That doesn't go on here in the United States because we have those pesky individual rights. Uh, when I say brainwashing, I can say thought reform if that kind of moves us away from the, you know, Manchurian candidate kinds of strobe lights blazing and that kind of thing. Uh, talking about thought reform, it's the idea that I'm going to change your belief system. I'm going to take a, a program that is sequenced, that is is written down in a sequence, and I've been trained to do it. And we're going to put you in a situation where you uh, are required to be here. You're required to hear this, and you're going to be fed certain information that is going to elicit certain responses from you. I will give you the example of Lisa Spangerman, who is a counseling psychologist at Arizona University of Arizona. She is a very highly placed dean there. Her work, and her work from last year in 2022, was on the summer of Black Lives Matter. Her research has shown that, and a lot of other research has shown, that you can be made to feel guilty about virtually anything if you are provided certain information in a tightly circumscribed environment like a classroom, that you can be made to feel good about things that you have nothing to do with. Why is this important? Because this is part of the brainwashing technique of showing quote unquote white students uh, images that are designed to make them feel guilty about certain things that they had nothing to do with so that then they are more easily mobilized to quote, do the work of anti-racism. 
Mm. In other words, manipulating people to feel guilty about something they had nothing to do with mm. and then mobilizing them to actually do something else. That's brainwashing right there, clear and simple. Now, let me give you a couple of quotes. Um, the brainwash itself and what you've described about you know, looking at TikTok, well, you turn it off. Plus, you have access to a whole host of other, you could call it counter programming. What we find in these types of, say, courses on uh, anti-capitalist courses. The kind of, we don't find the works of Ayn Rand. We don't find the works of Adam Smith. We don't, I've looked at a syllabus on the history of capitalism, okay? The, the works of Karl Marx and Adam Smith don't appear anywhere in there in the history of capitalism. In fact, there's only one book, really, that that's kind of applies to us by Jurgen Koka uh, on the history of capitalism with a little 150-page volume, which kind of touches, touches various aspects of it, but no primary sources. Instead, we find out a lot about um, uh, sugar beet uh, farming and sugar cane in, in South America. Basically, the professor's, you know, pet interests, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So what you're exposed to in a particular venue and what we call milieu management, this is their term. They're being their term. They being student affairs. This is their term, milieu, milieu management, which ties in with Robert J. Lifton's notation or observation of milieu control. When you can control the milieu of a student who is on campus in a dormitory and message them 24-7 over and over again, I'm quasi-quoting folks in the literature, and it also appears in my book, Brutal Minds, then you can repeat this message and you will seize opportunities outside the classroom because you control that environment to a large extent, where people live. You can hold workshops on the floor where people live, where you propound this type of this type of, of ideology. But again, the brainwash consists of basically three stages. And these stages, of course, are broken down into multiples uh, within each main frame. Unfreezing, changing, and refreezing. I will give you an example right here of, uh, of a book that has a brainwashing model. It's called Designing Transformative Multicultural Initiatives by Sherry K. Watt. In this book, Sherry K. Watt propounds what she calls the PI, or the Privilege Identity Exploration Model. And in this model, she says you will, and she's teaching other teachers, she says that you will destabilize the student's sense of self. Mm -hmm. You will destabilize the student's sense of identity. You'll, it will result in a kind of vertigo where the student is seeking an anchor. This is in the book. This yeah. is not something that's being made up, right? No, I, let me, yeah. Let me give you a, a, another book here, Teaching for Diversity and Social Justice. This is a brainwash manual. If you too want to learn how to brainwash students, go to the manual. And you'll find this three stages right here. Let me quote. Let me quote from the book really quick, the three main stages. First of all, you have to put the students at ease. You're not going to say, hey, I'm, I'm Scott Newman. I'm going to brainwash you. Come on in. You don't do that. You say, hey, no. I'm Scott Newman. Here's some pizza. Look at my big smile. We're going to play a game called the privilege walk. And I'm going to ask you some questions. Whenever you have privilege, you walk forward. When you don't, you step back. And we're going to have a, a visual representation yeah. of all the folks who have privilege. Mm -hmm. Well, what you've just done is you've submitted to a questionnaire. And you've revealed a lot of information about your parents, about yourself, about your friends, um, without even realizing you, were, you did this in the format of a game. And the facilitator will constantly ask you, for your trust, make yourself vulnerable. I'm modeling trust. Trust the three folks in here. Here's what they say. This is their instructions. Use low risk self-disclosure and interaction in the early stages to establish a norm of self-disclosure at the outset. If the environment is perceived as supportive, a person's defense may be permeable, which indicates to me that they're going after you with an attack. Moving into the, the first phase here, during this this uh, unfreezing phase that they call defending. Students undergo challenges to their belief system in an environment that is supportive and trustworthy. Moving to the unfreeze, I'm sorry, the, uh, the changing. Students are presented social justice theory. The, project, the uh, process is, quote, confusing, disorienting, frightening. Students might feel out of control without known boundaries or familiar ground, and they may experience strong emotions such as anger, resentment, a sense of betrayal by those who were supposed to tell them the truth about the social world. That's mm. moving you right along into a new belief system. And finally, when I've got you, I've got you hooked, we're going to refreeze it. This, a new sense, a new set of beliefs becomes home base for interpreting experience and creating meaning. The past is reinterpreted and reconstructed into a new frame of reference.
That's the brainwash, clear and simple, in their own words. I've got a number of books that line that lay this all out. And in Brutal Minds, I talk about this in their own words. I will tell you, uh, Scott, there's been no critique of the book to speak of. The only reviews that you'll find on Amazon are bas basically lies about the book, that, that I don't present any examples. The book is rife with examples, that I don't talk enough about the students who are the victims of the brainwash. Well, the book is about the brainwashers. There's lots of books out there that talk about students. And, uh, you know, Charlie Kirk's book on, uh, you know, the college scam is one of them. David Horowitz has some one fine volumes out there. Catherine uh, Sposato has a good book out that talks about these anecdotes. <laughs> um, my volume talks about the brainwashers, the techniques they use, how they use them, why they use them, and who they use them on, and the damage that they can do. You ever see that uh, Yuri Benzimov video from 1984? Yuri Desmenov. <laughs> yes, I have. He's a former KGB guy based in India. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing video. Um, yeah, I was watching that. I was watching that the other day, mm -hmm. which incidentally in the lead up to, uh, lead up to this interview. Um, and it got me, I mean, it, it reinvigorated an idea that had already been percolating in my mind for a while, which was that when I look at, you know, a hundred different pronouns, um, or I look at some of the drastic anti-racism measures being suggested, uh, or, or where, you know, follow the money, where the money that's donated to Black Lives Matter actually goes, and does it reach the intended beneficiaries? Does it reach the families of those uh, wrongfully killed in some cases? Um, I, I ask myself, okay, some of this stuff is really ludicrous and outrageous and like a hundred pronouns. Like if someone had told me that, like when I was, when I was at college, there were tampons in the men's bathrooms. And when, when I was, when I was, you know, uh, a teenager even, or, or a young boy, if someone asked me, it's just what, what's the world going to look like in 10, 15 years? I, I couldn't have jumped to this up and, Nobody else could have either. I mean, some of the stuff is so yeah. ridiculous that you ask yourself, okay, this is really beyond, like, just far beyond the pale. Yeah. The Overton window, while I was shifting, it like can't, it can't shift that much this quickly. And so then you ask yourself, is there like a group of people abroad just like laughing, like seeing, like, how ridiculous can we make this before they realize what's going on? Uh, no worries. Um, I wonder, is there a group of people saying, how ridiculous can we make this uh, before people realize what's going on? Or is it sort of the mutated bastard child of former Soviet propaganda? Um, I don't think there's like a small cabal of, of disseminators who like get together you know, once a month and talk about like which new pronouns they're going to introduce. So I'm, I, I fall more into like the mutated bastard child camp, but I like, I'm thinking about the Zira Bensmov interview and it, where he talks about, for those who haven't seen it, that the primary activities of the KGB are not espionage and James Bond style things. They're influence campaigns uh, and they're propaganda campaigns propaganda campaigns, the most effective ones, of course, we never notice. It's like, the you know, the fish never notices that he's swimming in water. The lobster doesn't know he's in hot water until he starts <clears throat> boiling on. Um, so I return to this question. I mean, we, we prodded around with it a little bit at the beginning. Um, but thinking of, of Yuri Bensmo, you have to pardon my terrible pronunciation here. Um, is this the relic of a former influence campaign? Is it, you called it an active push? Is it the results of, of an active push going on? Where are some of the more outrageous ideas coming from? Or are they just like the mutant children of what were once kind of slightly reasonable ideas that should be debated like anything else? 
I think the source of the ideas is, is a critical theory and, and uh, the um, offshoots of uh, anti-racism and critical race theory um, that are grounded in neo-Marxism. And where does this, where do we find this sort of thing? Well, we can find it in various academic departments, but mainly education schools. I think there is a cabal that is coming up with these uh, various pushes to uh, radically change the college campus. And I, in Brutal Minds, I describe a triangle with three nodes. The first node, of course, being education schools that train people in advanced degrees to in student affairs and education management to fill positions in the bureaucracy. It's called student affairs. And they pursue, they being the, the bureaucrats, pursue a parallel curriculum. They call this the co-curriculum. When you go to a website to any college and you see co-curricular activities, that's the parallel curriculum where they are able to propound this ideology without any kind of oversight from faculty or otherwise. And this is where you'll find the workshops that I've described where the brainwashing takes place. Well, these student affairs bureaucrats, and this is key to what you just mentioned, have off-campus student organ, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, professional organizations called for the student affairs bureaucrats. They're called ACPA and NASPA, ACPA and NASPA. And these organizations are at 100% permeated with critical ideology, 100%. They have conferences, they publish books, they publish journals, they publish articles, they give awards. And you're saying to yourself, well, this is all well and good. Why, what does this have to do with the university? Well, this is where they train student affairs how to engage students in this uh, this brainwash method of stage by stage sequencing. And more importantly, they set the standards for education schools and the graduate degree. So here you have this circle of vice, education schools, student affairs, and the off-campus professional organizations. And this ideology is fairly seething right here. One of the, in fact, I, I named it a few moments ago boldly transforming higher education. That's, that's their goal. They want to transform the, the higher education from what it is now, where you have this marketplace of ideas, where ideas have to stand or fall on their merit and, and, and survive this questioning, this questioning uh, process, into institutions of indoctrination, whereby certain ideas are sacrosanct and cannot be criticized. Part of this has to do with enshrining what they call anti-racism into the bureaucracy. And you mentioned, haven't we reached the peak of woke? Uh, well, maybe so in the larger world, but the creation of these bureaucratic positions and the embarrassment of having created these positions, there's not going to be any retreat. There's going to be a doubling down on these highly paid bureaucrats who really don't do anything on the yeah. campus. They don't do anything for you know for 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 six figures, um, you know they tally they tally figures they do campus climate measures but they don't really do anything that wasn't being done uh, uh, earlier. The only difference is now we have these bureaucrats on campus who are seeking more and more power. If you look at a book called "It's Not Free Speech" by Michael Berube and Jennifer Ruth, it tells you it lays out the plan uh, in this book uh, about the desire to uh, erect a, an edifice in the bureaucracy of academic freedom committees. This is an Orwellian term here. Academic freedom committees that are staffed by faculty just like them and also bureaucrats from diversity, equity, and inclusion. And these, this academic freedom panel will oversee the work of the faculty in terms of hiring, in terms of syllabi, in terms of subject matter, in terms of hiring. Um, and so you'll have these mediocre bureaucrats in the DEI bureaucracy overseeing the faculty. This is completely new. This idea of this happening is completely new. So I think that this is really what I, this is really the new aspect of what I uh, uh, talk about. It's what's really new in the, in the last 20 years on the campus, this uh, three, this three corner triangle, the no other kind of uh, triangle. I call it the Cerberus or the three headed dog with one body. It's a right of Greek mythology. We tend to think it's three different entities, but it's all the same people. And they are working to transform the university day by day. I mean, if we go to the associations, the off-campus associations, right? For, I mean, first of all, the, I think we'll agree the first part of 
solving any problem is identifying the problem right. and talking about it. But if we go to these associations, we can't censor them. We can't put up roadblocks for them because if we were to censor them, we'd be no better than the Soviets. Well, what do you mean censor them? No one is saying, and no, I don't advocate uh, censoring their journals, censoring their books, uh, censoring, you know, I've got the books right here. I've made good use of these books. I have a collection of over 150 books. I no commend book. you for reading some of them, by the way, because in yeah. many cases, especially you see this on Twitter, people are going back and forth and they very obviously mm -hmm. haven't read the works that they claim to disagree with. Right. Well, a lot of people haven't, even, haven't mm. ever read Marx, you know? That's about, true. Yeah. Avowed Marxists I, in some cases haven't read Marx, and the people who critique Marx also haven't read Marx. No, which is, books, yeah, yeah. The, the, the two books that I think really people read auto read are The Capital and, and Ayn Rand's uh, fa, um, uh, Atlas Shrugged. Found, Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Shrugged, yeah. Fountainhead's good too, but Atlas Shrugged is the. Now, now, this book right here that I held up earlier, this book is this is the um, 2023 edition. It's come out in four different editions since 1997. I own all four editions. I've gone through them to compare the text. I found changes in labeling, but the text remains the same. As the labeling becomes you know, less, well, has a certain pejorative uh, uh, content to it or sound to it, a connotation, they change the labels. Uh, they began with Kurt Lewin's changing, or sorry, say unfreezing, changing, and, and refreezing. Unfreezing, changing, and refreezing, change that to defending, surrendering, and transforming. That sounded, it still sounds kind of, you know, they, they changed it to confirming con contradictions and continuity, which is benign, anodyne sounding, but the text and the process all remains uh, the same. Um, and so the, 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 the brainwash does, does change. I should tell you, this may be a, a new one for you and your listeners, the, the term re education. Where did that come from? Okay, well, I can tell you, it was uh, the guy, the father of the brainwash, the father of the modern encounter group in the 1940s was an MIT social psychologist by the name of Kurt Lewin. And he's the guy who came up with the three stages of change. And his, he's revered in the field of change management, of all things. Uh, he was working with criminals and trying to see how he could utilize encounter group therapy to change their belief system to prevent their, them backsliding into a life of crime. Oh, a, worthy, a worthy goal. He called all of this re-education. Now, in the 1990s, by that time, the term re-education had, had acquired an unsavory connotation. And so they, being the educationists, changed the term to transformative education. And this is what you hear today. So when you hear transformative education being talked about, it's really re-education in the brainwashing vein. Curiously, the communist Chinese have changed theirs from re-education to education for transformation. So it, it's, it's running on a kind of a, a parallel course. The idea is you're going to re-educate people in a very forceful uh, sort of sort of way. Right? So uh, now going back to your original question, if you can repeat that, I'll give you the nuts and bolts of it. The original question, I, I don't remember the exact words I used for the original question. It wasn't, it wasn't scripted. Um, but I think, I think that gives me a pretty good sense of, of, what I was looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, these these people are relentless. They're not going to give up. There's there's no compromise. It's uh, they are zealots uh, because they have because of this Plato's cave kind of thing. Arthur Kessler in The God That Failed. I, this is a book I highly recommend for uh, uh, 1949. The God That Failed. Uh, six writers who were former communists give testimony as to why they left the party. One of the one of whom the best of the whom I think of whom I think is Arthur Kessler. He talks about the epiphonic moment when he became a communist. When he, it's, it's like the scales fell from his eyes. He had answers to every question, which is the, actually the fatal flaw in Marxism. That, you know, oh, you see confirmations of it everywhere. You just have to know what to look at. Well, that's the key mark of pseudoscience. If it answers all questions, like psychoanalysis answers all questions, it's not really science. It's pseudoscience. It's an all-encompassing cosmology that explains everything in hindsight, but predicts absolutely nothing with any kind of reliability. Arthur Kessler identified this, and this is very akin to the epiphany that uh, students receive when they are they embrace the same type of ideology, running under some different labels, running under a different banner, uh, but really basically the same type of uh, the same type of old wine in a new bottle. Hmm. I like that metaphor, old wine, new bottle. It reminds yeah. me of there's this guy uh, Rudy Kurniawan, 
and he would do the opposite. He would take old bottles and stick new wine in them and sell mm -hmm. them as old bottles of wine. He was a mm -hmm. wine forger and he became very wealthy doing this until, as I said, up right up until the point that he was caught. Cheating can be a very effective strategy in the short term. Yeah. But eventually the truth catches up to all of them. You got to know when to get out, but they never do know when to get out, right? I think in a lot of cases, actually, they do know and they choose not to. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it, this has me now thinking about truth. I think one issue with communist ideas or Marxist ideas is that Marxism as a discipline is not interested in truth. Truth, I mean, to the extent, I, I'm not talking about like one absolute truth. I'm talking about just like, or like a religious truth. I'm talking about just truth. Can, is this true? Can I trust my own eyes here? A lot of people in the Soviet Union, you, you were there in the, in the 90s, correct? Or, or before? I visited the Soviet Union when it was still Soviet Union in 1988. Right. And, uh, and since that time, about 20 times, and I went to school there in summer of 2005. But I actually, I actually stood in a bread line mm. in 1988. And why did I do that? So I could say later on that I stood in the bread line mm. uh, for no other reason. But I know I stood in a communist bread line waiting for I never I didn't wait until I get the bread. The bread I think around the bread by the time I got up there. Mm. No, I. Well, 88, thing, things were already yeah. starting to change. The, the change mm -hmm. was underway. But, I mean, going, you know, go back a couple of years, this question of truth, can you trust your own eyes? In the Soviet Union, in a lot of cases, the answer was no. You cannot trust your own eyes because you see something and then you're told that green is not greener. I, I forget what the – you mentioned somebody had a quote of this nature earlier that you cited in the interview, like – um, trust your eyes. You see the blue is blue in a lot of cases. Well, it was Ronald Reagan who said, uh, don't be afraid to see what you see. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a wonderful quote. I hadn't, I hadn't heard that. Um, I, I know when Reagan was being wheeled into the ER, uh, once he, he looked up at the doctors practicing and he said, I hope you boys are Republicans, <laughs> uh, which is funny, but I mean, Marxism and we'll wrap up here in a second. Um, Marxism as an ideology doesn't seem to to value truth as an end unto itself. It's almost like post-truth, like the truth isn't good enough. So we can come up with a better version of things. Um, what would you say to that? I think one of the reasons they do this is because, you know, when you see uh, a dilapidated, you know, a, a rundown train and you're on a train and you're rolling along and it's, and, and this is, this is an example. They always like to trains. They being the, the pilgrims that went over to the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, they weren't seeing a dilapidated train. They were seeing possibilities for the future. They were seeing a train that was in transition and they're always, their eyes are always uh, colored with this this lens that that th we're moving toward a bright and bounteous bounteous future. I give the example of the greengrocer in my it's Vaclav Havel's example. He's the playwright who was the first president yep. of the Czech Republic. I give this example in the introduction to uh, to a Brutal Minds, where the shopkeeper, a greengrocer, is required to put a sign in his window, and the window the sign says, "Workers of the world unite." Now he doesn't really pay attention to the sign. He just knows. And he doesn't know whether it's true or not. He doesn't know whether it's a, it's a worthy goal. He just puts it in the window because he knows that if he doesn't, there's going to be some trouble for him somewhere down the line. He's told to put the sign in the window. And this is what Vaclav Havel calls living within the lie. You know, we talked about truth. This is kind of the other side of that. We have a big lie going on here in the Soviet Union and Czech Republic uh, to a certain extent in the United States. And we're expected to live that lie. Um, the idea that students will stand up in class and say, well, I'm committed to social justice. Uh, that's not the, really the truth. They're saying something to be able to get along without being nailed by the DEI police, by maybe being being uh, reported on one of those anonymous snitch lines without having the bias response team visit him at his dorm or contact him to come in to, uh, to the juridical processes of a university. We understand that you're making people feel unsafe in class because you won't endure social justice, that kind of thing. So we, in other words, we, we perform and we live the lie uh, that is presented to us just so we can keep the people in power from getting on our case, just to get out of here and maybe go take that job 
at uh, at uh, uh, I was going to say Lehman Brothers, but they're out of business now, right? I was going to say at uh, at BlackRock, something like that. So yeah, yeah. So so you know, so that's what I, I like the idea of the uh, the, the Vaclav Havel example of living within the law today in in the United States. It would be. Diversity and inclusion would be the sign we put in our window and you can't criticize it. You can't, you have to put it in the window. And I can testify that that is that this pervasive nature of this noxious ideology uh, is, uh, is growing uh, on the college campus. Oh, I mean, but it, it's a banner. It's, it, I could give you other examples of pronouns. Have you put your pronouns in the, in the uh, signature line of your email or have you put them on LinkedIn? Um, have you, do you, do you know, are you, do you have a, a sticker of a pride flag on your computer? Mm -hmm. It's very much living within the lie, uh, sort of a way to fit in with the group. You think everyone else is doing, it. there's this thing called the Abilene paradox, um, where this family from Abilene, Par Abilene, Texas, each of the individual members are told that the other members of the family want to go to the water park. But none, none of the individual members actually want to go to the water park, but they're all told that the other ones do. And so the family gets into the minivan and they drive to the water park, despite none of the individuals actually wanting to go. Uh, it was Stephen Pinker wrote about this. He called it pluralistic ignorance um, in, in The Better Angels of Our Nature, a title that was lifted, of Pink, course. Pinker's from, great. He's, Pink, he's great. I love his book, Enlightenment Now. It's a, it's a fabulous book and I highly recommend it. It's another good one. I like he lifted the better angels of our nature from Lincoln's second inaugural address because I remember reading Lincoln's second inaugural address and saying, "Wait a minute, uh, honest Abe was around before Mister Pinker. Where did he where did he get this verbiage?" Mm -hmm. um, but the Abilene paradigm is a perfect example of of living living within the lie. And lastly, I just this is kind of a, a humorous anecdote. I was in I was in Prague for a, for a conference. Um, on what was happening in Ukraine in, oh, at my tender age, I tend to forget. I think it was July of 2022. Um, I was in Prague uh, and we were like learning about Václav Havel. I was, I was listening to a lecture or something about it. Um, and then we all went and we drank in this bar called the Golden Tide. Not we, not all of us, me and this other guy, uh, my friend, we went in an older uh, Serbian gentleman who'd moved to the Czech Republic a long time ago and saw it transition from uh, from Czechoslovakia into the Czech Republic into now uh, the Czech part and, and, and the Slovak part. Um, I think they changed last year the name to Czechia from the Czech Republic, which mm -hmm. I don't know the verbiage. Anyway, we're in this bar called the Golden Tiger, drinking beer. They come and they, you know, they refill your cup. Talking good all beer. about good beer, right? Good beer, good pilsner. Oh yeah. Um, talking about uh, the playwright, uh, the playwright leader. He was he was a playwright. He was a poet. Um, and I think I think all of our leaders, to be honest, should read poetry every morning. There should be some kind of literary exam. Have you read the Have you read these books? Of course. What books get included and in, and in, in what don't? Yeah. Um, but maybe they should have to write entrance exams like we do for colleges about their you know their top fifty mm -hmm. favorite books to show that they have in fact read fifty books from across the ideological spectrum. I think a number of leaders would fail, many would pass, and uh, but I think a sizable minority would not. Well, we'd all be the better for it, no doubt. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I did. Did they serve you pork knee while you were there in Prague? I did eat pork knee, not at the Golden Tiger. Yeah. I ate it at this huge, like cafeteria, like it's dining good, huh? hall where they come and they schlep it down. Yeah, and we, you know, more pilsner. The pork knee was good. I love. I like the Czech Republic. You can see the the relics of yeah. um, of uh, Soviet, like Soviet rule yeah. everywhere. Um, but Prague, Prague is a beautiful city. I would I would say in addition to reading, however many number of books, everyone should also perhaps be. Uh, required to take a course at Drexel with uh, Professor Ridgely. I can't. I can't argue with that. Guarantee my <laughs> guarantee my employment for years to come. Right? Um, uh, anyway, thank you so much for coming onto the show. I had a really great time uh, chatting with you today, and uh, I look forward to keeping in touch. That sounds great. Thanks a lot.